We're here at Antigua Forum with Declan Ganley. And Declan, you're a very successful telecom entrepreneur. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you became interested in telecoms and also sort of your journey as an entrepreneur? Well, it started uh, very early um, in my, uh, when I was in my teens in Ireland. Uh, my curiosity with telecommunications began uh, when I used to go over. I was born in England of Irish uh, parents. I used to go back to a, 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 an island off the west coast of Ireland called Ackle Island. And one of my uncles was a, a, a radio hobbyist. He used to you know, build radios and that kind of thing. So he had the hobbyist magazines at my grandmother's house. And it used to rain uh, more often than perhaps we would have liked um, there. And so on those rainy days, I would flick through these hobbyist magazines. And that's what got me interested in, in, in radio uh, it, it, as, a, as a kid. Um, as an entrepreneur, my first entrepreneurial endeavor, and I didn't know that's what it was at the time, was to harvest peat, which is something that we dry and burn as a fuel. Uh, I would harvest it in my summer holidays, went off school for the summer, and sell it in the local markets uh, to make a few pounds. That was the currency that we had in Ireland at the time. And uh, use that to, I would buy shares uh, uh, during my school breaks and, uh, and dabble in the stock market in a very, very amateurish way. Um, but I learned through trial and error um, what the market was and how you interacted with it. Um, it wasn't, it was sometimes a cause of concern to my family. Selling turf wasn't considered to be, let's say, the most noble of pursuits uh, when I was uh, a teenager and my, God rest her, my, my very old great aunt uh, was a businesswoman in a local town called Dunmore. And, one uh, very early morning, I showed up and got, got it to get the prime location on the, uh, in, on the market day in the square of the town. And uh, she sent her son out uh, to me and he said, well, how much are you looking for this load of peat? <clears throat> and I said, whatever the price was, 70 pounds, 80 pounds, I can't remember. And so he said, well, your, your great aunt would like to buy it off you. I said, fine, and he came out and paid me. And about half an hour later, she sent him out again. He said, why are you still here? <laughs> you should be gone. She wanted to get me off the square before anybody saw me. So uh, anyway, later on, uh, as I um, finished school in Ireland, and I never went to college, I went to London. I, I got a, a job as a, a, a very junior uh, job at making tea and coffee in an office in the city in London. And uh, I maintained that interest in communications while I was in Ireland, I was in the Irish Army, National Guard, the Reserve uh, uh, Army, and uh, I was very interested in communications there. I was in an artillery regiment, but communications are important in, well, in any discipline in the military. So I continued that interest there. <clears throat> and then uh, when I was uh, in London, I was working in this marine insurance brokerage. I said to uh, one of the guys whose uh, tea I used to make, you know, we should look at ensuring the launch of communication satellites from the West, but on Soviet launch platforms, because Challenger, the space shuttle, had blown up the year before in, in 1986, so this was 1987. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, I called the then Soviet trade delegation, ended up being invited to go to Moscow in 1988, which I did. I tried to put this deal together, this crazy idea to launch Western satellites on Soviet platforms. Of course, it happens all the time now but that was a completely novel idea back then. Uh, it didn't happen, the time wasn't right. Um, but I ended up uh, exporting aluminium from the uh, then Soviet Union in very small quantities through uh, Latvia, which was still part of the Soviet Union at the time. They declared independence in 1991. Uh, and I ended up uh, setting up a timber exporting business in Latvia because they needed to generate foreign currency revenue somehow. And then I ended up doing a privatization of the forestry industry up into northwestern Russia, privatizing 28 sawmills. And I eventually sold that business in, in, in 1997. But all the while, I kept my interest in communications. I bid for the second mobile phone license in Ireland in 1995. I brought in a partner from the US, uh, Comcast, a very, you know, now a very large company, uh, to partner with me in that effort back then. And then uh, I founded a, uh, I didn't win that license in Ireland at the time, but I, I used some of the team there to found a business called Broadnet, 
which did a roll up of fixed wireless licenses, what they called LMDS licenses in, uh, in Europe. And uh, we secured those licenses across 10 countries in Europe. We built out the top 42 cities in Germany, the top 14 in France and various others. I exited that business, uh, Comcast took that over. Uh, and uh, in, in 99, 2000, and then uh, in, when 9-11 happened, um, uh, my wife's family business was in World Trade Center 2, uh, run by her eldest brother, who had taken it over from her grandfather. That uh, event was uh, hit our family very hard. Everybody survived, but many of the fa family friends were lost. Um, the, the business that was being run literally uh, was, was wiped out. And uh, the, I decided to look at how I could bring my expertise in broadband uh, and apply it uh, in the US. I also did a roll up, by the way, of the cable industry in Bulgaria by privatizing small, what they call sort of mom and pop cable operators, and then dropping in a fiber optic ring around the country uh, to join, connect all of these, these municipal cable operations. Um, the, oh, I, by the way, very important to say as well, I also did a dot com in the last dot com bubble called Adornis.com, uh, which I, I left uh, and lost a very large sum of capital in because it didn't work out. I pulled the plug on it and walked away. And this was a lesson. It was a very, very hard lesson at the time. All the creditors were paid, but it was a, it was a business failure, and, and, I, and I learned from that. Uh, I went on to found um, uh, Rivada Networks in 2004, um, and the primary focus was on providing emergency communications capability to public safety in the US. Our first deployment was in Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And through that experience, I learned about the, the need and practicality of um, and the, the potential to turn radio spectrum bandwidth into a commodity. So that if you lit up a particular area, a few blocks of a city from one cell, if you could parcel that out by time of day and volume of bandwidth concerned, and then you could build a marketplace where you offered that as a commodity, that commodity would be, could be traded. And that commodity uh, of radio spectrum bandwidth, um, once you could commoditize it and package that way, that this is something that there's massive demand for and that um, it would be the world's next great commodity. It could be bigger than oil, um, certainly bigger than things like soybeans, uh, grain. And uh, so we got to work on that and we invented, and I'm one of the co-inventors of dynamic spectrum arbitrage technology, which is the way of, of, of allocating and managing spectrum to allow for accurate price discovery and flexibility in a dynamic market. Bandwidth at 4.15 in the morning is not worth anything like the same as bandwidth at 8.30 in the morning. The fact that this pricing is similar is extremely inefficient. It means that traffic that should be there at 4.15 in the morning is not, and traffic maybe that is there at 7.30 in the morning that shouldn't be there because it's priced incorrectly uh, needs to be moved around. So allowing for accurate price discovery is very important because it encourages much more efficient use of bandwidth and it means that you, in a nutshell, you can raise private capital and put it to work to pay for networks uh, that previously would not have been considered viable. So uh, the model lends itself to uh, much more extensive rural coverage and much higher capacity urban coverage. Uh, we focused on the public safety space at the beginning because public safety networks have traditionally cost governments a lot of money to build. So the model that we took was we will build those networks using private capital, public safety, have ruthless preemption to all of that network wherever and whenever they need it, meaning that within 30 milliseconds they're on the network and it's like there's no one else on it. But for all of the rest of the time that public safety or defense agencies aren't using that bandwidth, it's available for use by the general economy through this marketplace. You're not pre-picking winners, the market's doing that all of the time. And you mentioned uh, Hurricane Katrina. Can you tell us a bit about your work there because you were awarded for it as well. Yes, yeah, we got the Louisiana Distinguished Service Medal um, for that. Um, that was, a, it was a very, very trying time, a very moving experience. I went down there with a team. I lived in Louisiana. 
uh, in, a, in a trailer for, uh, for three months at the time in that response. Uh, we provided communications to all sorts of uh, uh, responding agencies, to the National Guard and, and many other the state police and many other agencies at the time. Um, and the Adjutant General of the Louisiana National Guard very, was very kind and generous to recognize our, our, our actions at that time uh, with the Louisiana Distinguished Service Medal, which credited our actions with saving lives and, uh, and making a real difference. And, uh, it was a, a privilege uh, to be able to respond in the way that we did. We learned a lot from that exercise. Well, it wasn't an exercise, it was a real world deployment. And indeed we've deployed for multiple you know, disasters, natural disasters and events since that time. Um, but, uh, and that I have to say was really the experience that got me thinking about new ways to be able to utilize and allocate bandwidth that would make it available during disasters and emergencies, but available to the general economy in normal times. You also have a, a strong interest in, in liberty and, and free market economics. Um, do you think that telecom can play a part in that? And if yes. so, how? Uh, well, we see it every day. I mean, just, you know, look at your smartphone, get onto Twitter, Facebook, um, you know, the, the, the dissemination of news information and ideas happens at a greater pace than we've ever seen before in the history of the world. I think that is a great thing. Um, it allows ideas uh, that are for freedom, for liberty, um, for free markets to spread uh, and f to, to reach corners where previously they didn't reach. These ideas become viral and, you know, it should be a case where the best ideas win. And these forms of media and these forms of technology make the, uh, the, the, the promotion of those ideas and the uh, profligation of those ideas uh, much more easy. The barriers to entry to ideas are lowered. Education and self-education becomes um, much more easy uh, and it's inexpensive. The cost of access is going down and things like commoditizing bandwidth will lower that cost of access even further. These are forces for good and, it's, uh, and innovation is uh, actually central at this point to the ideas, the, the ideas and promotion of liberty around the world. And sort of following on that interest in liberty, you also founded Libertas uh, Institute. Um, can you tell us about what that is and why you, why you founded it? I founded it, it was set up originally as a think tank to, to think about initially Ireland's place in the European Union and what sort of reforms Europe would need to adopt. I read the European Constitution as had been drafted by the uh, Presidium over, chaired by Valéry Giscard d'Estaing and I was, I, was, I was alarmed when I read that, that Constitution because it did not build the construct or the institutional or democratic construct necessary for Europe to be able to protect the sorts of ideals that we're talking about. Liberty, democracy, transparency, accountability. It transferred sovereignty away from member states and away from citizens to the center in Brussels without handing back corresponding accountability. So the power was being handed away but the levers of power were being severed between the citizen and those institutions that were exercising them, which I believe makes those institutions semi-legitimate and somewhat dysfunctional, or certainly in the, in the long-term construct of those institutions. We need credible, capable institutions at the European level. I am a European federalist. I want a United States of Europe. I've never made a secret of that but I want it to be built on the principle of subsidiarity, of bottom-up democracy, of accountability. I think only those powers that need to be concentrated at the federal level should exist there, which means that most of the powers should exist at local and member state level. And then I want the, the interest and power uh, in the European Union to be balanced. So we need a bicameral legislature so that the smaller member states that have smaller populations, like Ireland, for example, can balance out the bigger member states. The way to do that is by having a European Senate where this, every member state has an equal voice. And you balance that out by having a lower house that is based upon population. So Germany, for example, would have many more seats in that, the lower house than somewhere like Ireland or Malta would. 
And then we need to be able to foster a European demos and to be able to build a European politic, we need European debates. People don't vote on European issues in European elections. People don't turn out in adequate numbers in European elections because no one knows what it's about. The way to do that is create an elected office that is competed for for the presidency of the European Union. I believe that we should combine the offices of the presidency of the European Council and the presidency of the European Commission into one elected position, maybe one six-year term, term limited to one term only, and make that position popularly elected. You could have an electoral college so that the, the, the votes of citizens in smaller member states aren't completely negated by those in larger member states, but this is the type of competition of ideas, a market for ideas about the future of Europe that we need to be able to foster. And the only way to do that is set up the competitive process where those ideas clash, where we hear competing ideas rather than this big sort of mulchy middle um, and this, this groupthink consensus that we currently see at the European Union level, which isn't really getting us very far. We have a European Union that, as I believe, is chronically insolvent, that is facing a massive pensions crisis in the future, where we have lethargic or zero growth that is not pro-enterprise. And we still, although we have a market of 500 million people in the European Union, it is not a market that has yet been freed. We don't have a single market in services. That's ridiculous. And even in products, if you look at all of the hidden barriers and tariffs and backdoor taxes that are maintained as barriers to entry, um, we clearly have a problem. And then we look at youth unemployment in places like Greece and Spain and Italy, and we know that something's very, very wrong. Um, what is wrong with Europe right now is it is, has been captured by crony corporatism. Crony corporatism is the greatest enemy that free market capitalism has. Socialism isn't its greatest enemy, it's crony corporatism. And that's what Europe is right now. It is a crony, it's been captured by crony corporatists. We see regulatory capture right across the European Union, and we see the bailout of crony corporatists with the transfer of failed risk to taxpayers right across the European Union, with, for example, these bank bailouts. Europe has to embrace the freedom to fail, and only when it embraces the freedom to, freedom to fail introduces a pan-European bankruptcy code so that, people, that enterprises that are not viable can go bankrupt, go through that bankruptcy process, can we find the healthy tissue from which we can grow. We have to lower the barriers to entry for youth to be able to engage in the economy and to allow for the free exchange of goods, services, and ideas right across Europe. That's where Europe's future lies. We need Europe to be strong. We need Europe to be respected and have real, a real voice in the globe. Um, and, and it's patently in every member state of the European Union's interest that this happens. Britain is not going to remain important in the global context if it withdraws from the European Union. I mean, some good friends of mine on the other side of this debate will say, well, you know, Britain could be like Norway or Switzerland or Singapore. And I say to them, is that really the destiny that you see for Britain? It's not so much the risk that they're wrong about that, but it's that they're right. Nobody asks what's Norway's view in the great affairs of the world. That's not to in any way you know, denigrate Norway. It's a great country. But it doesn't, it's not going to swing policy when up against giants like China or the United States or other places. Europe can be the most dynamic, vibrant economy in the world. I know that. I don't just believe it, I know it. We just have to remove these barriers to entry. We have to free up our markets. We have to embrace democracy and the ideas that, the, the types of cultural ideas that made Europe great in, in, in previous times. You also, in Europe, you worked with Club de Madrid, for example, and other government leaders. Um, what have you been doing with them? And also, um, how is that challenge different uh, than working in an entrepreneurial uh, way? It's exactly the same challenge. I, I, you know, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur when I think about government. I'm an entrepreneur when I think about telecommunications. Um, the, you know, we have to innovate, we have to be able to compete, we have to be able to win, and we have to be able to keep adapting our ideas to new challenges that present themselves all of the time. But in terms of what am I doing right now with all of these other things, right now I'm focused on being the best possible chief executive officer of Rivada Networks that I can be. 
My focus right now is in revolutionizing the telecommunications and broadband business by turning radio band spe spectrum bandwidth into a commodity. I believe that that's going to have a very powerful effect on the world. I think it's going to have a very powerful effect on those economies that adopt this technology. If you look at the GDP effect that, for example, the ad adaptation of um, cellular technology has where it was adding 4 5% to GDP in some countries, I think that the commoditization of bandwidth, the lowering of barriers to entry to access to bandwidth and to allow free pricing of bandwidth to take place, I think that you're probably going to see a similar effect on GDP over the next sort of 10 to 15 years that, that you could have 4 or 5% effect on GDP by commoditizing bandwidth. Uh, and I also think that that model will move into other areas like, for example, uh, the financing of roads, bridges, that sort of thing. There's a lot that's going to happen around the Internet of Things where once bandwidth is allowed to be accurately priced in a much more dynamic way, that you're going to see new technologies, new entrepreneurs come into the marketplace providing solutions that use that commodity in a much more efficient way than it has been up to now. Thank you very much, Declan. Thank you.